If you ask any scientist, climate change is one of the most pressing issues facing our society today. And at first glance, it seems like it is given the coverage it deserves in the media. A quick Google search will bring up roughly 150 million results. But in too many cases, it has become associated with doom and gloom stories and quickly pushed to the back of people's minds. Climate change has very real physical consequences in Australian landscapes on a day-to-day -day basis. In this video, we ask the question, what are the consequences of elevated carbon dioxide, warmer average temperatures, and changed weather patterns and rainfall for plants? These quiet achievers fix and release vast amounts of CO2 and are responsible for absorbing a third of the carbon dioxide emissions since the Industrial Revolution. There is a fascinating array of processes that range from the minute leaf level to the entire forest ecosystem of Australia. At first, plants appear to benefit from the CO2 fertilisation effect. The Rubisco molecule requires a threshold of CO2 concentrations in its immediate environment to synthesise simple sugars. Higher ambient CO2 concentrations will expand Rubisco's capability to fix carbon. This will result in more starch and more soluble carbohydrate stored in the leaves and other plant organs. But will this affect all plant biochemical systems equally? Not necessarily. Benefits are believed to be limited to C3 plants, such as our forests. In C4 plants, carbon is actively transported to the Rubisco molecule, rather than by diffusion alone, and therefore will have less to gain from increased ambient CO2. However, this has been found to be heavily limited by nutrient availability in Australian environments, as demonstrated by the whole tree chamber experiments at the University of Western Sydney. So this is one of 12 whole tree chambers present here at the Hawkesbury Forest Experiment. And in essence, we can grow trees in soil in a forest setting. One of the amazing things about the chamber is that it allows us complete control over the climate in which the trees are growing. So we can dial up CO2 concentrations of the future or air temperatures of the future and apply them in combination to individual trees growing inside the chambers at this site. So I looked at the response um, to high CO2 um, under conditions where phosphorus and water limited growth. Um, so we always saw about a 30% increase in, in growth um, of eucalypts when there was plenty of water and plenty of phosphorus, yeah. but under low phosphorus conditions, you, you don't see a response to CO2. Increased atmospheric CO2 has a direct impact on plant anatomy over geological time. This is demonstrated in the trade-off between maximising carbon intake and minimising water loss. Around 200 million years ago, when the Wollomai pine evolved, atmospheric CO2 concentrations were at least twice as high as they are today. Stomata were larger in size, and lower in density. If we're going to ask anyone or anything about the effect of climate change on plants, we should ask these two little guys here. Today we're joined by two Wollomai pine plants. This one grown under CO2 concentrations similar to today, and this one grown under concentrations about 1,500 parts per million. In a much later period, eucalypts evolved during a far lower CO2 environment. This resulted in stomata that are smaller in size but larger in density. With this anatomy, scientists believe that eucalypts may be more water efficient in high CO2 environments. To meet their carbon needs, their stomata don't need to be open as long and they lose less water. But does this largely theoretical concept translate to reality? A consequence of high CO2 is an increase in average global temperature. Unfortunately, higher temperatures cause plants to increase transpiration rates and are therefore likely to negate any gain in water use efficiency. One example of how plants can influence plant anatomy is in their vascular architecture. 
Plants that are adapted to hot, dry conditions have tighter, smaller vessels. Plants with sparse, wide vessels, which are made for absorbing large, constant volumes of water to the canopy, are more fragile and are likely to embolize. If you have a vascular tour that is geared towards safety, then you're doing very well with climate change effects. And you probably prosper because there will be less competition and you could probably extend your range. Further to water stress, some plants will be especially susceptible to temperature changes which are moved outside of their evolved optimal growth ranges. There's a really open question as to whether tropical forests nearer, nearer the equator are in fact more sensitive to climate warming than, than more temperate forests mm. that may naturally experience seasonal and, and interannual variation in temperature. Uh, and some of our research and studies have indicated that uh, growth of tropical species whose ge natural geographic ranges end in the tropics, they respond much more negatively to climate warming than do other populations of the same species grown in more temperate climates. And so that's a really a question of biogeography. Uh, are tropical taxa, tropical tree species, more sensitive to climate warming or not? The projected average Australian climate warming of 3% by 2070 represents a shift in climate equivalent of moving 900 kilometres from Sydney to Brisbane. Australian ecosystems are unique for being exceptionally genetically diverse. Some experts think that this will provide an advantage to Australian plants. I generally think that most of Australians, Australia's ecosystems are fairly resilient and are fairly plastic. When you think of eucalyptus as a species that, as a genus that now has about 800 plus species, it tells you something of how, how well this genus has evolved over millions and millions of years to cope with different climates, which means Tasmania with cold temperatures, high rainfall, which means central deserts with basically no rainfall and just access to groundwater. So the range that eucalyptus as a species can cover um, tells us something of how much plasticity is within that genus. We really don't know the extent to which that genetic variability is indeed adaptive or in fact perhaps maladaptive if trees are adapted to their local environmental conditions and climate change changes too rapidly to uh, uh, accommodate forest growth into the future. This demonstrates the high degree of uncertainty surrounding predictions of Australian plants at an ecosystem level. Unfortunately, it's challenging to develop a way of making accurate predictions at a global or even an ecosystem scale. To solve this, scientists are physically testing how Australian ecosystems are responding to increases in carbon dioxide. So basically we've got six of these rings, or rays that they call them, and three of them are elevated CO2 and three of them are controls. Right. So they just blow air. So what happens is there's a big fan at the bottom yeah. that sucks in air and blows it around the big black donut. Yeah. And then depending on which way the wind is blowing, valves open at the bottom of each of these vertical pipes and emit the, the air in the upwind side, which then gets carried across the plot. Uh -huh. And then we oh, add CO2 into that airstream to raise the concentration. One predicted aspect of elevated CO2 being investigated at the uke face site is the reduction in nitrogen content of woody tissue, leaf litter and seeds of plants. This is likely to reduce the capacity of microbes to break down litter and cause nitrogen to remain locked in organic matter molecules rather than in the mineralized forms required for plant uptake. Consequently, the C2N ratios in soils will increase, inhibiting plant growth. Much of Australia's plants are adapted to fire. In fact, many of these plants are serotonous, which means that fire is an essential part of their life cycle. The buildup of carbon-rich leaf litter, as explained previously, is likely to increase fuel loads in Australian forests. This, combined with hotter temperatures and lower humidity, strongly suggests an increase in the frequency and intensity of fires. Ultimately, 
changing fire regimes may alter composition of ecosystems. For most regions in Australia, plants are water limited. Agriculture has had to cope with highly variable patterns of rainfall since its introduction 200 years ago. So much so that Australian farmers are renowned internationally for their resilience in coping with extreme climatic conditions. However, climate models are predicting that the El Nino Southern Oscillation weather pattern that dominates Australia's rainfall predictions is likely to increase in its extremes. With longer, hotter droughts during El Nino and more intense rainfall in La Nina years. Australia appears to be unlucky in the predictions of future rainfall. Our most important agricultural area, the Murray-Darling Basin, is predicted to experience hotter and drier conditions, whereas areas with expected increased rainfall, such as Northwest Australia, do not have the capabilities to support agricultural production as they are dominated by desert regions and poor soils. Furthermore, this increased rainfall is expected to occur mostly in the form of intense short-term events, dumping large volumes of rain in cyclonic conditions. So I hope you see it is clear that climate change will fundamentally alter the functioning of plants in Australia. To summarise, Jan Conroy, an eminent Australian plant scientist, claims the responsibility lies with those who understand the science to take the lead in providing strategies of adaption and mitigation. We need to act now and so I think as much as you can get involved and we need, we've got the good science to underpin what we should be doing. I mean it's not that, that we don't have the science but the decision should be made on, on strong science and I'm afraid that it can only be done through political action so mm -hmm. I mean we have to stop burning fossil fuels and or reduce the use of fossil fuels, um, in, in, you know, promote the use of um, other energy sources such as wind and, and solar. It's not like trying to, like if you pollute a river that you might be able to clean it up but you're not going to be able to reverse, you know, the increase in, in CO2 and other greenhouse gas concentrations. So we have to act now, I mean it's absolutely mm -hmm. vital.